Hello and welcome to lecture 14 of the course Theory of Computation. In the previous lectures, uh, we saw pumping lemma for regular languages, which was a way to show that uh, certain languages are not regular. So, pumping lemma was a necessary condition for languages to be regular. So, if a certain language does not satisfy those conditions, uh, then one could infer that that language was not regular. So, uh, as mentioned during the lecture, uh, we cannot use pumping lemma to show that a language is regular. We can only use pumping lemma to show that languages are not regular. right? So, in this uh, lecture, we will see myhill nerode theorem, which was discovered by John Myhill and Anil Nerode in 1958, uh, which is a necessary and sufficient condition. Okay? So, once we uh, try to verify the conditions uh, in, the, in the theorem, uh, if the conditions are met, we know that the language is regular and if the condition is not met, then we know that the language is not regular. Right? So, this is both necessary and sufficient. So, in that sense, this is a bit, uh, this is superior to the pumping lemma, but then uh, checking the condition themselves, the conditions themselves is, is not that easy as, as you will see. right? Uh, one point is that this is not there in the book, uh, the pumping uh, in the Sipser book, it is not uh, explained in the book. Uh, it, it is listed as two exercises 1.51 and 1.52. However, we will go through it in, in, in detail and we will also give all the proofs that is necessary. Okay. Okay. So, myhill nerode theorem is a, is, is a necessary and sufficient condition for languages to be regular. So, before we get to stating the theorem itself, we need some, some definitions, we need to set up some definitions. Right? So, the first definition is uh, being distinguishable by a language. Right? So, let x and y be strings over an alphabet sigma and let l be a language over the same alphabet. Right? So, we say that x and y are distinguishable by the language l. If there is a z that we can append, if there is a z that you can append, uh, to x and y such that one of them belongs to the language and the other one does not belong to the language. Right? So, either x z is an L and y z is not an L or vice versa. So, vice versa means the opposite x z not in L and y z is in L. So, we want we say that it is distinguishable by L if you can append a z upon appending a z to the x right so z is also some string so upon appending that z uh, xz belongs to the language and yz does not or the opposite yz belongs to the language and xz does not right so this if this happens we say that x and y are distinguishable by l um, okay so l this is stated for any two strings x and y over the alphabet and where L is any language over the alphabet, right? So, L, I'm, in this definition, I am not saying L is regular or anything like that, right? All I am saying is that X and Y are two strings, L is a language. When is, when do we say that X and Y are distinguishable by the language L? So, for instance, suppose X is in the language and Y is not in the language, then automatically they are distinguishable by the language because uh, one, one, one Z that works is the empty strings epsilon. So, if x is in the language and y is not in the language, so x appended by the empty string is x itself which is in the language and y appended by empty string is y itself which is not in the language. Right? So, if one of them is in the language, the other one is not in the language, we are automatically done. Right? However, uh, x, y may be both in the language, but then maybe there is a z that when you append that z, uh, x z belongs to the language and y z does not belong to the language or the opposite. Uh, right? So, right. So that is the definition distinguishable by the uh, by the language L. Okay. So x and y are distinguishable if you if there is some string which when you append to the uh, to the to the strings x and y, one of them belongs to the language, the other one does not. If they are not distinguishable, meaning whatever z you append, 
either both of them belong to the language and or both of them do not belong to the language right so we want to create this opposite situation one of them belongs and the other one does not if it is not the case meaning whatever z you append both of them x z and y z either belong to the language together or do not belong to the language together when that happens we say that we say that it is indistinguishable by l okay so indistinguishable by l and uh, this is this has a certain notation the notation is that uh, x uh, three lines so an equal equal to symbol has two lines so this has three lines it's an equivalent symbol subscript l uh, x equivalent to y subscript l so x so so this this can be thought of as an l equivalence okay so this is the symbol for x equivalent to y uh, or s is x is in x and y are indistinguishable by l so notice we first define distinguishable if you can append as z such that one of them xz is in the language and yz is not or opposite when the strings are not distinguishable right meaning whatever z you append either xz and yz belong to the language or xz and yz do not belong to the language then we say we are they are indistinguishable by the language and for indistinguishability we have this notation the equivalence notation okay so the notation is for indistinguishability and uh, the one interesting thing is that being indistinguishable is an equivalence relation uh, so what is equivalence relation we need to show three things uh, i will not fully show them show them but i will explain them so one is uh, reflexive two is uh, symmetric and three is transitive okay so reflexive means x is equivalent to itself this is a uh, true um, uh, trivially because x um, you, you can just verify this right so if xz is 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 indistinguishable from itself right so if xz is in the language xz also has to be in the language right symmetric means if x uh, so basically it's like commutativity x equivalent to y uh, implies that y equivalent to x right so this is also trivially true because uh, the way we have defined this there is no uh, it, it is not like x and y play exactly the same role so even if you change the roles of x and y it is change the order of x and y it doesn't really matter so this also easily follows transitivity is uh, x equivalent to y and y equivalent to z right so if x and y are indistinguishable and y and z are indistinguishable together imply that x and z are indistinguishable so this is the only one if you want to show equivalence relation this is the only one the third one that takes some work the other two are almost immediate right so these are the three uh, conditions for uh, equivalence relation so once any relation so here a relation meaning equal to is an relation right and here the distinguish indistinguishability is a relation so once any uh, relation satisfies these three conditions we say it's an equivalence relation so another example of an equivalence relation is uh, let's say e over the set of all natural numbers right so 0 1 2 3 uh, up to infinity um we say that two numbers are equivalent if they have the same remainder when divided by 5 right so right so share the same remainder when divided by 5 so so that sets 1 and 6 are equivalent because they, when they divided by 5 1 and 6 say leave the same remainder 6 and 11 are equivalent 7 and 12 are equivalent 7 and 22 are equivalent right and uh, one thing that an equivalence relation does is it partitions the entire space into equivalence classes so for instance if you take the remainder when divided by 5 equivalence relation the entire space of natural numbers gets partitioned into five classes the multiples of 
the, the, the numbers that leave a remainder 1 when divided by 5, the numbers that leave a remainder 2 when divided by 5, those who leave a remainder 3 and those who leave a, leave a remainder 4. There are 5 classes, right. So, for example, uh, mod 5 equivalence relation partitions all integers. So, I said natural numbers, but it is also true for integers into 5 equivalence classes. Right. Those based on the remainder uh, based on the the remainder when divided by 5. Right. So, this is an example for an equivalence relation partitioning the integers. Partitioning meaning each integer goes into exactly one of these classes, right? It is not like these classes overlap there, and so it's a meaning they are disjoint classes, and together they they divide the entire set of integers or natural numbers. So in this case, right? So here we have uh, indistinguishable by L as an equivalence relation, and the things that you can compare using this relation are the set of all strings over a certain alphabet, sigma star. Right. Um, um, so, so, uh, uh, um, so in this case, what happens? This relation uh, partitions the sigma star, right? So maybe I'll just use another color. Similarly, this relation. partitions sigma star right into equivalence classes equivalence classes right so when it partitions um, you get some number of equivalence classes right and uh, anything so anything inside a certain class uh, um, if you look at a certain class, anything within the certain class are uh, indistinguishable, but two different classes are not distinguishable, right? So that's what this uh, this this relation will do. Um, so maybe I'll just give a very quick uh, uh, example of indistinguishable by L, right? So uh, so for a moment you can ignore the the uh, whatever I've written over here. But uh, so consider L to be, or maybe I'll just call it A. Consider A to be zero power n, one power n, n greater than zero. So this we know is is not a regular language, and consider this set of strings. Let's say let me call it S. Um, let's say zero, zero, zero. 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 I claim that they are they are all distinguishable by L. So, you take any two. So, for instance, uh, if you take the string 1, 0 1 is is in A and 0 0 1 is not in A. Right? So, this means that 0 and 0 0 are not distinguishable by uh, or are distinguishable by the uh, sorry so i cannot use this so this means it so 0 and 0 0 are distinguishable by a right because you append 1 and similarly 0 0 1 1 is in a but 0 0 0 1 1 is not in A. So, 0 0 and 0 0 0 are distinguishable.
So just to give an example of what distinguishable means. Right? Anyway, so coming back to what we were saying, uh, so being not distinguishable is an equivalence relation and that equivalence relation partitions the entire uh, set of strings into equivalence classes. Right? So now two more uh, definitions. Uh, suppose L is a language, again I am not insisting that L is regular and X be some set of strings. We say that X is pairwise distinguishable by L. Okay? So the definition is pairwise distinguishability. We say that X is pairwise distinguishable by L. If any two strings, any two distinct strings in the set X, capital X are distinguishable. So, for instance, uh, the example that we just saw, right? Uh, if you if you take the set, uh, so maybe I'll just call it, I'll just call it X instead of S, right? Any two uh, sets X, uh, any two symbols, any two strings from the set X, you can see that you can indeed verify that they are not, um, they are distinguishable by the language. So, by, by the language A. So, for instance, 0, 1 is an A, but 0, 0, 1 is not an A. So, 0 and 0, 0 are not distinguishable, are distinguishable. 0, 0, 1, 1 is an A, but 0, 0, 0, 1, 1 is not an A. So, 0, 0 and 0, 0, 0 are also distinguishable. And you take any two, right? So, if you take 0, 0 and 0, 0, 0, 0, um, the string 1 distinguishes them, right? So, this is, so this means that we can verify that above x is pairwise distinguishable by a. Pairwise distinguishable by a means that set any two you take they must be distinguishable. Okay, so, this is what uh, distinguishable by A means, pairwise distinguishable by A language means. It is a set, the set is pairwise distinguishable if any two distinct elements of that set is pairwise is distinguishable by the language. Right? The third definition is that of the index of a language. Right? So, notice that so far we have not used, uh, we have just L some language, we have not been saying anything about whether L is regular or not. All these definitions are for a language, for some language, right. So, the index of L is the, so is the size of the largest set X, right, such that X is pairwise distinguishable. So, here we had, uh, so just, just to give another, uh, the same example again. Here we had A which was not a regular language like 0 power n, 1 power n. We have a set X here which is pairwise distinguishable right? because any 2 is distinguishable. So, this set is of size 4. Now, can you make a bigger set, maybe a superset of this, but not necessarily that, that is pairwise, distinguish, pairwise distinguishable by A. So, and what is the biggest set that you can make that is pairwise distinguishable by A? The size of that set is the index of A. Right? So, here uh, we know that the index is at least 4 because there is a set of size 4 that is pairwise distinguishable, but it could be 5, it could be 6. Right? So, that is the uh, definition of index. It is the largest size of the largest set of strings that is pairwise distinguishable by the language. So, earlier I mentioned the, the equivalence class thing. right? So, any equivalence uh, relation uh, partitions the entire set of strings into equivalence classes. So, basically if there are 10 equivalence classes, let us say uh, this, this, this uh, indistinguishable by uh, the language uh, partitions the, the set of all strings into 10 equivalence classes. That means, from each equivalence class you can pick one one uh, 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 string. You can pick one string from each of the equivalence classes and they, this is the maximum that you can take. Right? If there are 10 classes, you can pick one from each. 
because if you pick 11 then by pigeon hole principle you must be picking 2 from some class and there will they will not be distinguishable right. So, the index is actually asking what is the number of equivalence classes uh, how many equivalence uh, the, the relation indistinguishable by the language L right this this relation it partitions sigma star into equivalence classes what is the number of equivalence classes that we get right if it partitions into 10 equivalence classes then I can get uh, a pairwise distinguishable set of size 10 right but if it if it partitions into only 6 equivalence classes then I, I can only the largest set that I can construct is of 6 from each equivalence class I can pick one representative and that is the best that we can do right. For instance in the case of uh, uh, integers modulo of 5 uh, I can only pick uh, a one number that uh, uh, that is a multiple of 5 one number with remainder 1 one number with, with remainder 2 and so on like I can only pick 5 such representatives. If you pick a sixth number the, it will be equivalent or it will be it will have the same uh, remainder with as, as one of the other representatives already chosen. So, index is basically ask the number of equivalence classes that sigma star uh, uh, number of equivalence classes of sigma star when uh, uh, so uh, the, 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 the equivalence relation indistinguishable by L right. So, this this one how many equivalence classes does it divide sigma star into that is the index. And my hill road theorem. So, now after all this definition, so we, we defined distinguishable by L, then we defined indistinguishable by L, we said that indistinguishable by L is an equivalence relation, and then we said that it divides the entire set of strings into equivalence classes. Index is the number of equivalence classes, right. So, after all this definition, we come to the theorem statement. All it is saying is that a language L is regular if and only if it has a finite index right. So, the statement is simple, but then we required some build up a language L is regular if and only if it has a finite index meaning regular implies finite index and finite index implies regular. Moreover, uh, if, if the language is regular then it has a finite index let us say the index is 10 then we can construct a DFA of size 10 size meaning the number of states 10 that recognizes the language right. So, index is also the uh, the size of the smallest DFA that recognizes L. So, size of the smallest or size of a smallest right, right because the, 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 the DFA that recognizes L may not be unique I do not know let us say a smallest DFA that recognizes L. So, this is the theorem a language is regular if and only if it has it has finite index and if it is regular the index is also the size of the smallest DFA that recognizes the language. And uh, so, basically like any of these theorems if and only if this uh, we have to show both directions and both directions are split into lemma 1 and lemma 2. So, lemma 1 says that if L has uh, is recognized by a DFA with k states then the index is at most k. Right? If there is a if there is a DFA with k states that recognizes the language then the index is upper bounded by k. Right? Lemma 2 states that if the index is some number k then there is a d, uh, k where k is a finite number then there is a DFA with k states that recognizes L. Right? First one says that whatever be the number of states index is at most that then it says that if index is finite then there is a DFA with that many states. So, putting these two together we get the theorem lemma 1 and lemma 2 together imply the theorem let us quickly see how right. So, suppose L is regular right. So, we have to show that if L is regular it has a finite index and if it has a finite index it has a regular and then the second statement the size of the smallest DFA that recognizes is equal to the index right. Suppose L is regular which means there is a DFA suppose it now consider the smallest DFA suppose it has 10 states. Now, by lemma 1 it, it says that the index is at most 10 right. So, so the same thing if, if the DFA is m and if m has k states 
lemma 1 implies that index is at most k right. So, that is what we wanted to show if it is regular then the index is some fine upper bounded by some finite number right and further we have that further we have that index is the size of the smallest DFA that recognizes L right index is at upper bounded by the smallest DFA right. We, we got that index is less than or equal to the size of the smallest DFA. It, it could be it could be smaller, but at least we know that index is no not more than that. Now, the second claim or this, this, the other direction is the opposite right. If it has a finite index, we want to show it is regular. Suppose it has a finite index let us say k. Now, lemma 2 says that if it has a finite index, then there is a DFA with k states right. So, then there is a DFA with k states which means L is regular right which means L is regular and uh, and and further uh, we have that uh, the size of the smallest DFA is at most k which is the index right. So, again I am just writing that down. I am sorry, I am trying to draw a box, but somehow I will just give up. Ah. Okay, let it let it be. So, the size of the smallest DFA that recognizes L is at most the index, right. And now comparing these two, uh, uh, so what have we shown? We have shown that if L is regular, lemma 1 implies that uh, the, the index is at most the size of the DFA that recognizes L and 2 if L has a finite index, then lemma 2 says that there is a DFA with number of states equal to the index that recognizes L. So, the size of the smallest DFA cannot be more than that. Right? Now, comparing these two boxes, right, meaning this, this box and this box this and this box uh, right these two boxes it follows that uh, index is equal to the size of the smallest DFA that recognizes L which was a second statement right which is a second sentence the sentence second side sentence of the, the theorem right. So, even this has been shown. Right. So, that is how we show the uh, uh, the proof of the myhill road theorem using the lemma. So, I have not shown the proofs of the lemmas themselves, I am just using the lemmas, but then the lemmas itself look like this, the statement of the theorem itself right. So, now we will now that we have uh, broken down the uh, theorem statement into uh, these two lemmas. Uh, perhaps uh, we will we, we'll see the proof of the lemmas. And um, considering the time, I think I will split the video into the uh, lecture 14th, where I will show the proof of the lemmas. So, what have we seen here? We saw the, uh, the definitions that go into the Myhelner root theorem. The definitions are uh, x and uh, y, when are x and y in, uh, distinguishable by a language L, when are they indistinguishable by a language, right? So, which are the opposite then we saw that indistinguishability is an equivalence relation and then this equivalence relation uh, divides the set of all strings into equivalence classes right and the index of a language is the number of classes that the indistinguishability relation divides sigma star into right and the statement of the theorem is that a language l is regular if and only if the index of L is finite and second the index of L is also equal to the number of states of a smallest DFA that recognizes that language right. And the proof of the myhill root theorem is basically by two lemmas that prove either direction and what I said is that we will uh, complete the proofs in the uh, next lecture lecture number 15. So, that is it from me for lecture number 14. See you at lecture number 15 where I will complete the proof. Thank you.